This morning, we are continuing our look at the book of 1 Timothy, uh, which we're calling Blueprints. There's so many things in this book that help us structure our church, structure our lives. And today is a challenging one, and not to make Tim feel awkward, <laughs> but it is, what does it take? To, that's, <laughs> this is accidental, by the way. We didn't plan to talk about uh, what does it take to be a leader on this week. Um, and much as it was on the first part when we looked at false teaching, as the person bringing the message, I have really had to check myself <laughs> this week. And today I believe it's the same, because it's uncomfortable, some of the stuff in this uh, teaching. And to be honest, that's my prayer. If I can just make you uncomfortable this morning, then I think we're on the right track. We're going to read from 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7. 1 Timothy 3, 1 to 7. The saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of overseer, he desires a noble task. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent but gentle, nor quarrelsome, nor a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? He must not be a recent convert, or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders, so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Okay, first things first. The more eagle-eyed among you, can you sit this down just a touch? We'll have noticed that last week we were in 1 Timothy 1, verse 12 to 17, and we're now in 1 Timothy 3, verses 1 to 7, and you may be asking the question, Where's chapter 1, verse 18 to 20, and where's all of chapter 2? Are we skipping the bit about women in church? How dare we? <laughs> no, we've not skipped them, don't worry. What we've done is we've gone a little bit out of order. And there's three main reasons for this. And I don't know if I need to explain it, but I'm going to anyway. First of all, I was down to preach this week, and I was going to follow on in order, but it seems right that I do this message and not pass this message on to somebody else. Does that make sense? Um, second, if we did it in order, the week afterwards you would be getting the qualifications for deacons and servant. And there's similarities between these two messages and you'd have had quite two similar messages next to each other. Uh, I also wanted to uh, pair up certain messages with certain preachers. So there's a little bit of shuffling over the next few weeks. Um, I had fun picking who was going to be doing the one about uh, men and women in church. <laughs> Sorry, Dad. Um, so, I guess the first question is, <clears throat> what is an overseer? Paul says the saying is trustworthy. If anyone aspires to the office of an overseer, he desires a noble task. What is an overseer? Well, the way the word's translated in the ESV is overseer. But different versions of the Bible use different words for this. So you'll see the word bishop, you'll see the word elder, church official, and church leader. The Greek word actually translates literally as oversight, supervisor, overseer. And different translations Render it a little bit differently to fit with whichever word you're using for church leader at the time it's written. Which makes sense, so you understand what's being said. So if you're using an older version of the Bible, then it will say bishop. Now for us, the simplest way to understand this this morning is church elder or church leadership, because that's the term we use here. And it's an interesting word, this word, because it's not actually used very much in the Greek. Um, it's used here, and it's also used in Acts 120, when it ex explains that to fill the office of Judas, after he hangs himself, another is chosen to take his place. 
So in that way, it refers to a leadership or apostleship role. It's something official. It's something assigned. The word itself means an intense look, to look intensely, which fits with the idea of someone who watches over and looks after a church. That's why I like the translation overseer, because it is the best way of understanding what the word means. And it's important that we understand it is about looking after and looking over the church. Because church leadership is not about position. It is about responsibility. It's about looking after, which means leading them in truth, providing vision, providing care, and providing a challenge for the good of the people. Also, it tells us that even in the days of the early church, there was a recognized structure of leadership. It's necessary to have that. Incidentally, the church at this point was not using anything new. This wasn't a new model. The overseers that were talked about were very similar in role and purpose to the rulers of the synagogue in the Jewish system. That, of course, makes sense. The early church was Jewish. So they didn't reinvent something that was already working. They worked in the same structure. The rulers of a local synagogue would look after the conduct of public worship. They would be the government and the discipline of a local synagogue. These were men who knew the law, who were of good repute, who were set apart by the laying on of hands. And a lot of the special qualifications that uh, Paul's going to tell Timothy about for this role were the same qualifications expected of these guys. They were called elders, rulers, or overseers. And this tradition went all the way back to the time of Moses. Local elders of the synagogue, of the church. So Paul's not reinventing anything. What he's doing is reinforcing something that exists. So what's happening here? Well, remember as we, when we started Timothy, Timothy went out to a troubled church. It was a big church, full of many people teaching false doctrine. And Timothy was sent there to charge some of them to stop. Now that's going to mean a few things. One, it means some people are going to have to be stepped down and need replacing. But it also means when the church is back on track again, the church will be expected to grow and new leaders would need to rise up. So Paul is giving Timothy advice on choosing the right people as opposed to the wrong people who had already been there. And he gives some qualifications for leadership. A leader needs to meet some standards. You know, sometimes you'll hear the quote, oh, God doesn't call the qualified. He qualifies the called. But remember, that's a saying and not scripture. It also doesn't make any sense because if God qualifies the called, they're no longer unqualified. So he's calling the qualified. God has standards that he expects. And Paul is giving Timothy advice of what to look for in someone. Now, I guess the question arises at this point, is what I'm about to share just applicable to church leaders? Does everybody else get to go home and have a Sunday lunch early today? <laughs> the answer to that is no. Because what's being discussed here is relevant to how we all live. Because what we're looking at is character. What we're looking at isn't just stuff that should be in place when you're leading, but actually it's stuff that should be in place for each and every one of us. So let's take a look into it. First thing we see, Paul says, if somebody desires this role, it's a noble thing. It's a good position to desire. There's nothing wrong with wanting to do it. Are those involved, those who feel called? Yes. But you know what, being called without a desire to do something, you'd be pretty miserable if you didn't want to do it. Let me tell you, I wanted to do this for a long time. Without that, dear me, you wouldn't last. Dear me. You were called, but you wanted it as well. If you hadn't have wanted it, you would not have lasted 40 years, would you? <laughs> 
It has to be something that you desire, otherwise you won't pursue it with all your heart. However, because it's noble, because it's important, it cannot be a free-for-all. Wanting it is not enough, because what you're wanting is a massive responsibility. If you, we have an attitude in the world today that troubles me. If you just want something enough, then that's enough for you to deserve having it. But we know that's not how the world works, is it? There must be gifting, there must be calling, and there must be a standard reached. Remember the context of what's going on in Timothy. Timothy is there to sort the church out. It means he needs to step some people up, and he needs to step some people down. So he needs some guidance in how he's going to go about it. Because if you don't have guidance, how do you know you're picking the right people? Some who seem right turn out to be big mistakes. Some who didn't seem ideal actually have got things that you can work through and actually work out really well. So Timothy needs advice on how to appoint these people into these roles. What advice does he give? Well, let's start 1 Timothy 3, verses 2 and 5. Therefore, an overseer must be above reproach, the husband of one wife, sober-minded, self-controlled, respectable, hospitable, able to teach, not a drunkard, not violent, but gentle, not quarrelsome, not a lover of money. He must manage his own household well, with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? So, what can we pull from this? First of all, there's a lot of things Paul isn't saying here. Paul doesn't mention calling. He doesn't really mention anointing. He doesn't really go into gifting apart from the ability to teach. And he certainly doesn't mention charisma. And initially, that seems strange, but it's not when you think about it. Because those things are obvious. Is that fair? Someone with a calling, someone with the anointing, someone with a gifting, that's obvious. Timothy didn't need telling that because Timothy had already gone through that. Timothy knew you had to be commissioned by the laying on of hands because Timothy was commissioned by the laying on of hands. Timothy was called, Timothy was trained, Timothy was gifted. So Timothy doesn't need explaining that. Because remember, this isn't a letter to us. This is a letter to Timothy. He knew this. So it didn't need to be in the letter. Timothy knew you need the call of God on your life. That you need to be born again of the Spirit and have an ability to study the Word. Let me tell you though, there's plenty of people who've got that. Gifting. Charisma. And Timothy would have been surrounded by people like that. But is that enough? See, Paul doesn't go on, on about having a calling or moving in the Spirit because it didn't need saying. That's obvious from the rest of Scripture. But it's not enough. It's not enough to say I've got a calling on my life. It's not enough to be gifted. It's not enough even to be anointed when you speak. You need something else. And that's what this list is about. It's all about character. A gifted man without character is the wrong man. A man with a call of God on his life, if he doesn't step up in his character, he's the wrong man. See, this list is not something unobtainable. It's not a list that sets leaders as supermen above everybody else. Because this list is the standard for Christian living. It's the standard for all of us. It's just when we come to choose people that are going to lead, it's vital. A leader has to live up to this. Everybody else should be living up to this, but a leader has to be. He must, Paul doesn't say it's... An overseer should be these things. He says an overseer must be these things. Now, this is very specific, what he's talking about. He's talking about eldership, church leadership. He's not even necessarily talking about the pastoral role, which we've kind of just put as the leader. 
We say pastor, what we really mean is lead elder. I mean, you know, that's kind of what the role is. But we, we're talking about eldership, leadership, overseers, and character is a must. Wanting it is not enough. Wanting's good, but it's not enough. Gifting's good, it's not enough. God's call, vital, but not enough. Sound doctrine, massive, but not enough on its own. Character, character is key. It's not the only thing. You can be right in character and not called of God. But to those who are called, character must be in place. Now we can easily go, well, what about grace? That's for salvation. To lead, there's requirements. Boy, this was a hard message to write. <laughs> Let me tell you why Paul places so much importance on character. A failure in character can destroy a church. When I think of great ministries that have failed, churches that have collapsed or imploded, great men and women of God who've seen to have it all, what is it that brings them down? Very rarely do I ever hear it being an issue of doctrine. That's not to discount doctrine, but very rarely. In fact, some people with bad doctrine seem to do better, but that's a whole other subject. I rarely hear it's because someone's not moving in the spirit enough. Or is not gifted enough. It's nearly always because their character has failed. You just need to, I mean, I don't know how many keep abreast of what's going on in America at the moment. In the Baptist church alone. The amount of ministers who've had to step down and it's all character. And often the things that we've mentioned in this passage go ignored or are never put in place because what we do, we make way for the gifting. We make way for someone with the anointing, moving in signs and wonders, and we don't check character. Or we go, we overlook it for the sake of someone's gifting. And let me tell you, that never ends well. <coughs> so, what points do Paul hit? Well, first of all, an overseer must be above reproach. Some translations of the Bible say blameless. There's a one to start with. Because <laughs> when you read that, you wonder, hang on, who's blameless? <laughs> Who, who's perfect? If that's the standard, um, bye. <laughs> we need to every leader of every church ever would need to step down immediately. But it's not about perfection. What it is about is about righteousness. It's about a character that is unimpeachable. Someone who has an integrity that is recognized. Why? Because church leaders are on public display. Let me tell you, if anyone is looking for a fault in a church, they'll start with the leaders. And you don't want an easy job to find something wrong. I also think of this particular point as like the, um, the subtitle before we get the other bits. Because we get above reproach, and then Paul kind of breaks down what above reproach is. Dare I say, even the list Paul's given here is not exhaustive. There's examples of other things that could bring church into disrepute that are not on this list. But they matter too. For example, Paul says nothing about having a foul mouth. But it's a character point. Paul doesn't say anything about fiddling his taxes. But that's a character issue too. All of those things fit into the idea of above reproach. So they're not on this list, but they're in the spirit of this list. Would be foolish to limit just the, limit, uh, just the list here, because above reproach is kind of a catch-all for character issues. 
The word used here for above reproach in Greek means not found wrong when attacked. In other words, if someone questions your character or questions your motive, they'd have nothing to go on. Now bear in mind, we're talking about leadership, but I really believe this is the standard for every Christian. You can't be a leader without it, but I believe as a Christian, this should be the standard that we're living. If someone questions your character or motive, they'd have nothing to go on. <laughs> That's a high standard. It's a high call. That's why Paul proceeds this with the highness of the calling, saying, this is important. Therefore, you need to be above reproach. He then goes on and gives some examples of what above reproach looks like. The husband of one wife. Now, does that mean a church leader has to be married? No. If that's the case, both Jesus and Paul were not qualified for leadership. But he shouldn't have more than one wife. Now remember the context. This is a multi-faith, multicultural city that Timothy is living in. And in both the Roman and the Jewish culture at this point, polygamy was prevalent. It happened. It wasn't good, and it wasn't right, but it was all around. It was common for men to have more than one wife. And Paul is very clear. That is not how you live. One man, one woman, that is the moral way. That's what God's called. But not just, it's not just about that. It's about faithfulness. A man who cheats on his wife should not lead a church. And I know that kind of sounds obvious. But remember the culture back then. It was different. The standards would, but the thing is, we've built our moral culture now on these values. But before these values were written, the moral culture was different. And Paul's calling it out. He's saying, you can't do that. You can't take a concubine. You can't do it. One man, one woman, remain faithful. Now, this isn't talking about remarriage after your wife has died, because at no point does Scripture declare that to be wrong. In fact, in um, Corinthians 7, 13, uh, 39, it's, it's regarded as proper. But this is about faithfulness, it's about loyalty, and it's about having good character. The idea is, love and affection is given to one woman, and that woman is as lawful and wedded wife. That's it. In today's culture, we have to stick firm with this. <coughs> because culture does not get to dictate what's right. Even if in culture it's common and accepted for people to be unfaithful, and that it doesn't matter, the man of God must stand apart from this sin. A man who cheats on his wife has no place in leading a church. And also, just make sure I get this in, it's a husband of one wife, not a husband of one husband. Anyway, moving on. <clears throat> Number 16, sober-minded and self-controlled. I'm combining these two because they're virtually the same thing. <coughs> this word means temperate, vigilant. Not intoxicated, free from negative influences, free from life dominating influences, someone who is balanced and in control of their life. This describes the person who is able to clearly think with clarity. <laughs> That's a bad sentence, sorry. <laughs> They're not constantly joking about everything, they know how to get serious when things are serious. This type of person is not easily riled up into confrontation. They're measured. This is someone who is not controlled by a substance, be it alcohol or nicotine. It is someone who is temperate. Now we'll come back to cigarettes and alcohol in a bit. Temperate in all 
things. A good way of describing this word is vigilant. Someone who is able to keep an eye on themselves. Because after all, how can you be vigilant with a church if you're not vigilant with yourself? How can you keep an eye on a church if you can't keep an eye on yourself? This also means somebody who emotionally is not up and down. You know the roller coaster, Christian? A leader can't be a roller coaster of emotion. High, then low. Because they're not in balance. This word is about being balanced, self controlled. If you're up and down all the time like a yo yo, <coughs> you're on a journey. And you'll learn to put on your helmet of salvation and win the battle in your mind. But until then, you should not be leading a church. Because how can you lead others if you can't lead yourself? Someone who is always up and down as an elder leads to a very unstable church. Someone who is ruled by emotion rather than the spirit of God. Someone who goes with feelings rather than the word. Because the feelings keep on changing. The next word is respectable. The idea of this word is orderly. Again, remember, I'm talking about leadership, but I'm also talking about Christian character. This is the standard for leadership. should be the aim for us all. Orderly. It's the same word translated as modest in uh, 1 Timothy 2.9. Orderly, dignified is the best way of describing it. This word refers to our outward conduct, to our behavior in public. This isn't just self-restraining in himself, but his outward bearing must match his inner life. How people see them must be how they are. I Many you go, but wait, 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 wait. God looks at the heart, and you don't know my heart. Correct. I don't. And neither do those who will judge the church based on what you're doing. The inside needs to be right, but outward conduct must also be right. If there's an exhibitionist, a tension seeking side to somebody that can lean towards immodesty, if you're always looking to disrupt people's conceptions of you and shock them, that is not orderly, that is not respectable. And those people should not be elders of a church. Modest and orderly. Good outward conduct. Because the world is watching and getting ready to judge. Next one. Hospitable. Willing to open up both their homes and their life to friends and to strangers. But not just your home because... Let's be honest, you can live around the corner from somebody now and never leave your house to go see them because we're in touch in different ways nowadays as well. So your time and your energy. It was of no slight importance back then because the presiding elders in the congregation would have to entertain strangers because a lot of ministers would travel and needed somewhere to stay. But even outside of that, it shows an openness and it shows a care. And yeah, we don't travel so much to each other's houses because everybody's locked in their own little boxes. <laughs> Or everybody's locked in their own little... There was. But that's okay. We can connect with people that way by valuing them. I hope you all know that I'll always, as much as I can, answer the phone. And reply as soon as I can. Sometimes to my detriment. <laughs> because it shows you're valued. The key is having time for people. Valuing people. Welcoming people. That someone's willing to serve people and get things done. See, some people want to lead without ever having served. <laughs> it doesn't work like that. Because actually a leader is a servant. Yeah. Next one. <coughs> <coughs> oh, dear me. Next one. Able to teach. This is the only one on this list that is related to gifting. The rest of this list is character. But... This is important. Notice able to teach and having all your theology correct is different because theology can be taught. But being able to teach is actually a gift. 
But I tell you at the same time, if you're not willing to learn and change, you'll never be a good teacher. You've got to be willing to take things on board, otherwise you'll never be a good teacher. Theology can be trained. Character can't. But the ability to teach matters. It's not something that everybody has. And that's okay. Not everybody's called to lead. But those who are called to lead must have the ability to teach. The elder should possess something more than just a willingness or a readiness. They need that ability to impart knowledge. It's not just about zeal, but about ability. Next one. Not a drunkard. By the way, I tried to find any picture that would work for that, and that's the best I could come up with. <laughs> the idea is not someone who is addicted to wine or intoxicate and drink. The verse in itself does not prohibit godly leadership from drinking alcoholic beverages, but from drunkenness. It's different. It doesn't mean teetotal, but someone who's relying on drink or turning to drink for comfort or keeps drinking to excess, they should not be leading a church because there's a character problem there. That also applies to other addictive substances, like nicotine. See, sm- do you know smoking's bad for you? But that's not the problem with it. The problem isn't the fact that it's going to kill you. The problem is it's addictive. And you rely on it. See, there's many who think that the health problem is the only issue, and that's, you know, I'm only harming my own body. No, no, it's about control and addiction. There's many who switch to vaping because it's more culturally acceptable and it's also hopefully more, more healthy, but who knows what we'll find in a few years' time, because it deals with the health problem. The trouble with it is it does nothing about the control problem. See, the real issue isn't your health. The real issue is you're relying on something. Now, if vaping's a stepping stone to stopping, great. But don't allow it to just become another dependence, another reliance. I know sometimes we seem like we're a little bit mean. <laughs> when we were small monsters to be in leadership where you've got to stop smoking. That's not mean. It's because that's the requirement. There have been church pastors who have secretly hid addictions, probably most often to drink. It starts perhaps as a way of numbing (laughs) the stress, but it becomes a dependence. I know of one very prominent pastor who I used to listen to all the time, who was brought down and brought into disrepute as a result of drink. Someone who has an addiction or reliance on a substance should not be the elder of a church. Not until that battle's won. When the battle's won, it's a different story. But again, for the rest of us, that's a battle we need to win. If something other than God's controlling your life, it needs to be gone. Incidentally, that's the case for a lot of things on this list. Disqualification isn't disqualification for life. It's disqualification until the battle's won. Next one. Not violent, but gentle. Violence here is both publicly and privately. Physical and emotional and verbal. For the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle toward all men. That's 2 Timothy 2.24. Let me tell you, someone who's a bully outside the church will be a bully in the church. Someone who wants to win every fight and doesn't rely on and rest in God should not be an elder. He wants someone who will handle situations (coughs) gently without escalating them. Someone who takes on the examples of Christ of dealing things with things and not the example of the world. An elder should not be threatening and should not be violent. A church leader should not be like a sergeant major shouting at people as if they're worse than them. No. 
This kind of bleeds into the next one as well, which is not quarrelsome. That's the kind of person who's always fighting over something or always arguing about something. Not just someone who wants to win every argument, but they are poor leaders because they don't listen. They just want to be right. If you blow your top at the slightest confrontation, if you can't let go of something until you've won, you would make a poor elder. But also, that's not good Christian character. The next one, not a lover of money. The King James Version puts this so well. <laughs> not greedy of filthy lucre. Greedy leaders is a sickness in church. And it's a one that in history we've seen many times. Greedy leaders will use the church for their own means. And that is not good. Because this is for Christ, not for us. When a leader loves money, the people become the means to an end. And sin is crouching at the door. He must manage his own household well, <coughs> with all dignity, keeping his children submissive. For if someone does not know how to manage his own household, how will he care for God's church? Isn't it great when Paul says the things that you don't feel comfortable saying yourself? <laughs> the godly leader demonstrates his ability to lead first in the home. Paul recognized that it's in the home where our Christianity is demonstrated most. Let me tell you, if you're different at home than you are in here, you've got a character problem. Bear in mind, of course, with all keeping dignity, his, sorry, with all dignity keeping his children submissive means he keeps them submissive in a dignified way. He isn't harsh. He isn't a bully with his children. He is not a tyrant at home. Now that doesn't mean his children have to be perfect. Or even be Christians. Because let's be honest, everybody has to make their own decision. If someone's job or position depends on our children staying in the faith, then their children are coming for the wrong reasons. It's that he deals with his children in a dignified way. This is important because a bully in the home will be a bully in the church. A man who yells out of reason at his family will be unreasonable with the way he deals with the church. And they are not fit to be an overseer. He must also be able to have his own house in order. Let me tell you, if his house is a mess, the church will be a mess. If he's lazy at home, I'm just going to climb out of this hole before I get any further in it. <laughs> you get the idea. <laughs> if he manages his personal household finances badly, he'll manage the churches badly. But you know what, all of this stuff, it's, you read this and you go, Man, that's a hard standard. And you go, actually, is it? Because in reality, this is the standard for all of us. When it comes to an elder, it's a must, but it's the standard for Christian living. This is the standard of a good Christian life. This is good Christian character. And if there's stuff on that list where you're like, I don't measure up, then that's something that we all have to measure up to. We all need to win that battle. That's the stuff that needs to grow in us as we walk with the Lord. And that's the reason for this next bit. He must not be a recent convert. <coughs> or he may become puffed up with conceit and fall into the condemnation of the devil. 
Moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders so that he may not fall into disgrace, into a snare of the devil. Now, obviously a new Christian is still growing in character, still growing in knowledge of the scriptures. I was a Christian for I think around about nine years before I was asked to become part of the eldership. And that's quite quick. Because it takes time to build character. It does not happen overnight. It takes time to grow in the knowledge of scripture. There's no shortcut. It takes time. But we have it's a common error today where we push new converts into the limelight either because they're famous or because they've got an amazing testimony. And I know Shane's, I think Shane's just out there. I know Shane's experienced that, where he's felt pushed further than he's comfortable with because his testimony is amazing. I know of somebody very famous who was famous in the music industry um, who was saved and the next week was put on stage with a Bible in his hand. And he didn't know what he was talking about. He hadn't had a chance to grow in his faith, and I tell you, it didn't end well. But I don't think that was his fault. Those who put him on the platform should never have put him in that position. If a successful businessman gets saved and immediately becomes an elder, Paul's saying, don't do that. Why? Because first of all, they don't have the grounding. But more dangerous, they don't have the character yet. He may become puffed up, prideful, and fall into the same condemnation as the devil. In other words, lost in an all-out rebellion against God, but convinced they're right. Fallen. And moreover, he must be well thought of by outsiders. Now what does that mean? Because I tell you, the world looks a good Christian character and doesn't like it. It means this. The charge of hypocrite should not be able to be brought against a church elder. Because they're living what they speak. People should see someone who stands by their morals, even if they don't agree with their morals. Someone who is not dishonest. Someone who doesn't treat his family badly. People should be able to see that. It should never be said when you select somebody as an elder that somebody from outside goes, well, that guy, he hits his wife. It should never be said. Well, that guy, he's got a worse mouth than me. Now, that's true of leaders, but I also believe that should be true of all of us. That guy's a Christian. Really? See, this is the focus of Paul's list. It's about character. And it's for everyone, character. I believe this is the core of what Paul's saying. It's not about what you've done, but who you have become. Who you are is more important than how much you know. And that is true for all of us. See, some people talk up a good game. The key is living up to what you talk. That's true for all of us. It is vital for leaders. See, it's not just a question of your calling or your skill. How's your character? And that's the challenge I want to leave us all with. Are we growing in character? Are we growing in our faith? Or are we treading water? Are we the same guy with the same problems we had 10 years ago? Is the stuff that you're like, I need to work on that, that's been there for a while now? It's time to change it. Are you growing in the knowledge of scripture? Is your character growing? <coughs> this isn't just a standard for a group of people. This is good Christian character. 
Eldership must have standards. Elderships must be appointed because they meet standards. See, people aren't just leaders because they want to be, or because they're the first person to put their hand up and volunteer. People aren't just leaders because they want to be leaders. It's a massive responsibility. That's one thing I believe is the biggest problem with the house church movement. Because the standards for leadership aren't there. And if you end up appointing yourself, you don't check your own standards as well. In fact, you can't appoint yourself because you can't exactly lay hands on yourself. Timothy had hands laid on him. He was commissioned. He was assigned. It was a formal setting somebody apart for the role. And the house church can't do that in the same way. This structure was brought in from the synagogue system for a reason. It's the right structure. Let me tell you, I believe we have a good eldership here. I depend on them hugely. You can't have three churches without having a good backup. But, I hope you don't mind me saying this, they're not as young as they used to be. That's fair. They are getting older. And we need to bring people up into that team. But we need to bring people up into that team who have character, who are not up and down, who can step up but meet the standard. And I would hope those people are sat in this room. Or will be sat in this room soon. (laughs) But that's where we need to step up. It's not something you go, I'll sort that out afterwards. It's got to be done first. He who desires that, desires a noble thing. But it comes with a standard. And it comes at great cost. But remember that actually the standard should be for us all. A good, godly character. And that's my hope for us as a church, that we are people where if you're looking for somebody with this standard, it's a feast of a choice (laughs) because we're all living up to it. Yeah, I know we're saved by grace, but we've got a growing character to become great men and women of God. Amen. Amen. Let's pray.